Hi, everybody. Um, okay. My name is David Berthold. I'm, I'm the uh, director of the Center of Creative Practices uh, here at NIDA. Um, and uh, here today, I'm on um, land of the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation. And I'm um, very pleased to be here. And I want to pay my respects to all elders, past and present. Um, and particularly at this time when, once again, there's a focus um, on the systemic violence and injustices experienced by um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, um, along with Black lives around the world. Um, and my guest today is Kate Mulvaney, OAM. Congratulations on your... <laughs> OMG. <laughs> Hi, everybody out there. It's a recent honour for you, actually, isn't it? Was it just earlier? Yeah, yeah, it was earlier this year. It came as a, a great surprise, um, but so lovely to, um, to, I guess, just be a, um, credited with doing something for the arts, I guess, and, and also the acknowledgement that um, the arts does indeed exist um, in other people's minds. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was nice to be able to take it on and also be able to use it in from now on to um to get into those conversations that I might not otherwise have been able to push my way into yeah <laughs> but, but I think as we chat today probably we'll become very aware of why an honor came your way because it's you know more than just your extraordinary work in the arts it's well beyond that and we'll get to that a little bit later but most recently I've been watching you as a as a nun with a gun <laughs> The best kind. The best kind. <laughs> Chasing Nazis. Yeah. On crime. Um, yeah. So uh, with uh, hanging out with Al, Al Pacino. Yeah, who? Who? Al, yeah. Al, is that his name? Al? That's his name. That's so his, the, yeah. yeah, so that's uh, streaming now, of course, on Prime Video. So um, an extraordinary experience that must have been. It was yeah. absolutely astounding. I still have no idea how it happened, um, but it was one of those moments uh, that we all hear about as artists, which was a, a, just a dream gig that almost literally fell into my lap. Um, I was, I, I was uh, just happy being a playwright and a stage actor and I did, I did a little bit of screen, I do screen, um, but I'm, I'm obviously a bit of a theatre animal mm. and was on a very brief holiday after having had surgery actually in, in Kyoto. And this, this audition came through from my managers in LA who, <laughs> not, it's not, this is no through, through no fault of theirs, I don't hear from very often because I'm so often, you know, in Australia working. And it was Sister Harriet. It was Sister Harriet in Hunters uh, for Jordan Peele and Monkey Paw. And so I put it down very, very quickly because I just love the writing. And then a couple of months later I found... I got a, a phone call saying, you got that Al Pacino job. And I went, <laughs> I didn't go for an Al Pacino job because he hadn't been kind of connected when I did the audition. And, and it was Hunters and I got the role and had to drop everything and move to go and hunt some Nazis. <laughs> yeah. Fabulous. It was really fabulous. Um, the great thing about that show, uh, getting back to the theatre side of things, is that they cast a lot of people who were highly involved in theatre, including Al, um, or, or had a, a really um, a great interest in theatre. So that whole cast and team that you see involved in that production uh, are also theatre animals. So we, we jigsawed together really well. Yeah, you totally are a theatre animal and uh, <laughs> as, as, an, as an actor and as a playwright. And, you know, I've known your work for a long time, for a good 20 years now, I've seen a lot yeah. of it. But even just in the last day or two, when I kind of brushed up on your career, I have to say, Kate, I was astounded by the, the sheer volume of your work. Wow, you can talk. That coming from you, my goodness. <laughs> but it's, 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 it kind of surprised me, actually, when I, you know, had a, had a reason to sit down and look at your career in more depth. Mm -hmm. um, and those two, those two strands in your career, acting and, and, and playwriting, are very much in tandem. I think when you studied it, Curtin University. In fact, you did a double major in acting and, and, and script writing. So from the very beginning, you know, your those two things were deeply entwined and perhaps even inseparable. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm interesting, you're a country girl, you grew up in Geraldton and WA. So I imagine in a place like that, there actually stories would have been revolving around that small town like quite a lot. Yeah, absolutely. They were not necessarily um, uh, stories that I was conscious of. Mm. Uh, Geraldton has a, a deep, um, obvious, obviously Indigenous history. Um, the Yamaji community is uh, the are the people that I grew up amongst and on the and whose land I was on. And um, but their history was never educated to me. Their history was never taught to me. Uh, but I was very very lucky to have countless friends um, uh, and community members that educated me whose stories I could listen to. Along with that, there was a, Geraldton is a port town, so there was. Um, a huge Vietnamese community. There was a huge Sicilian community, Greek community. And so I was surrounded constantly by these amazing stories. That was my culture. We, we had a beautiful theatre in Geraldton, there still is, but no one ever used it unless it was for, you know, a Stedford's, piano a Stedford's or the occasional dance class. But um, <clears throat> so that, that wasn't something that I, I didn't get to trot off to the theatre. There was no, there was no cultural kind of building present there that I could lose myself in, but I could lose myself in stories, in books, and in the, I guess, the energy of the land itself and the geography of the land itself. Uh, so yeah, I was, I was very lucky in that way. Um, to, when I did start at Curtin University, I could have, I probably had seen three plays in my life right. when I started studying theatre. Yeah, and I'd, I'd certainly never read a Shakespeare. <laughs> so you know you became a professional storyteller and that's the way I've heard you describe yourself a few times yeah what a cool job yeah rather than <laughs> the actor and playwright but you know holistically as a professional storyteller yeah yeah I, I knew I was good at storytelling um I was, I've told this story before so please stop me if it gets boring but I I was really sick as a child and spent a lot of time in hospital and so, and it was, it was pre kind of, you know, Captain Starlights and, and having, you know, kind of playstations and stuff that kids hospitals have now. There, were, there weren't even fish or anything, you know, it was just a, a really stark hospital ward. And, um, and so I had to learn to read very early. I had to learn to entertain myself. Um, I was often... Um, stuck on a uh, getting radiotherapy when no one else is allowed near you. So I had to escape into my own mind. I had to, there are so many other kids in my position as well. So we had to entertain each other, plus the parents and the nurses. If you could make the nurses smile, they were kind of a little bit cooler with you. Um, it was just a, a survival instinct more than anything were stories and reminding myself of the stories of my town and of the people around me. And that's that. I, I swear that's what got me through, and that's the reason that I was able to pursue um, a life of being a professional storyteller because it was it was kind of the only thing I was very good at. Yeah, I mean, it's an extraordinary story you have in your own life, and you know, yeah. the most you're talking about was a cancer um, yeah. that, that probably came from you know your dad's experience in Vietnam with Agent Orange, and that's, that's become right. a very big part of your life ever since, you know, your work in Vietnam and, yeah. and in that territory. So. Yeah, it's a huge thing. It's a legacy. Um, the cancer that I had uh, took away my ability to have children. And so a, a big part, the older I get, the more I go, I, I think my playwriting and my performances have become part of my legacy. They are the breadcrumbs I leave behind of my existence, mm -hmm. that I was here and I I created something and I birthed something. Um, and yeah, the older I get, the more I realize that perhaps that big body of work that um, I have, it doesn't feel like a big body of work to me. It feels like it, it's been complete joy to, to put it together. But uh, I think it's, uh, there's a little kind of desperate thread to it. And that's me going, please remember I was here. Please remember I was here because um, I, I want to leave something of myself. Uh, behind when I when I scoot off, <laughs> it's really beautiful, and there's there's a lot that a lot of breadcrumbs you're leaving. Let me tell you, 
Um, well, it's going to lead to a big gingerbread house, you know. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's the secret destination. Um, one of those really early stories you're talking about being in hospital that you came across was um, Masquerade. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because it's a really delightful story. Masquerade. Oh, I've got it here. <laughs> here, I can show you. Right. This is Masquerade. <laughs> This is my book um, that I was obsessed with as a child by Kit Williams. Um, and it came out around the time, a bit, a little bit before I got sick, but being in Geraldton and Perth, it didn't really hit us till <laughs> years later. And it's just basically a, um, a, a book of um, riddles and puzzles. What, what Kit Williams did was he made that golden amulet he buried it somewhere in the world and he put the answers to where it was buried in this book. And so as a little kid, kind of with all sorts of things happening to me that I didn't understand, this book that was full of riddles was something kind of tangible and, but also an escape. And so I just became obsessed with that book. Uh, many years later, Deborah Oswald actually uh, said to me, have you ever thought about writing for children? Or writing a play for families and I said oh no I'd be I'd be the worst person to do that I just and I thought unless I could make it masquerade there's something in that book that I think has a a, a beautiful youthful heart to it but also an adult consciousness of the darkness of the world yeah. and I managed through with help from lots of other people I managed to track down Kit Williams who is kind of ungoogleable he lives a very reclusive life and I said to him, I, I wanna, I'm an Australian playwright and I'd love to adapt your book, which got me through poss possibly the worst time of my life. And he said, if you can uh, come and meet me over in England on this very specific date, we'll yeah. talk. Right. And so I did. I, I, I went over there and I found my way to his tiny little beautiful village and he gave me the rights to masquerade and I ended up making that a show for, the, for Griffin and for the Sydney Festival and Melbourne Festival and the South Australian State Theatre Company. And it was, the, it was one of those amazing um, uh, moments that I, I, in my life that I just still pinch myself about. Yeah. Go, oh. um, yeah. Be nice to go back in time and say to my parents who are reading that to me for the umpteenth time, I promise it'll, <laughs> it'll pay it, off. Yeah. He, he, gave, he gave you a condition, didn't he? The background. The condition was... The condition was I had to include my own life as well as the book. So um, it had to include the story of a child with cancer in hospital and which was really confronting and very difficult to write. Uh, but I did. This, this book was given to me not by my parents but by my godmother, Tessa, uh, who took her own life. Uh, she suffered terrible um mental health issues and the help just wasn't there at that time um, so it was sort of the last gift she gave me she used to read it to me all the time and so there was a little bit of her in the play there was a little bit of me there was a little bit of my parents and there was all of Kit Williams and he just spotted that in me and, and asked me to to tick all those boxes which I did happily and I'm you, still in contact with Kit all the time I just adore him that's fantastic and you say that's an adaptation from about five years ago now wasn't it yeah yeah and, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, and actually, I'm struck by how many adaptations you've done. Like, I know. A lot. <laughs> Me too. I mean, <laughs> great, uh, an adaptation of Medea with Anne Louise Sachs, um, mm -hmm. Sheila's Mary Stewart for Sydney Theatre Company. Yeah. Jasper Jones, like uh, adapting that book in many, five or six different productions, you know, around. around. Yes. Um, yeah. And I guess most recently, um, Harp in the South, the Sydney Theatre Company, which was like t in two parts, like six hours or something. Seven, you know, hours. seven hours of drama. <laughs> like that's a that's big. That's a big adaptation. It was big. It was yeah. big. And it was my first show at the STC as well. I'd never written for the right. STC before, and I remember sitting there on first preview to a like quarter full house and going, "Oh my God, what? Who?" do I think I am that I can make this audience sit through a seven hour play when I've never had a show on at this comp a company this big before. And um, it all turned out for the best, <laughs> but, but yeah, it was, 
I never expected myself to be an adapter either. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of add to those that I also did, it was dramaturg, I did dramaturgy on uh, the Scottish play and on Julius Caesar and on Richard III. Um, but a lot of that was so, especially Julius Caesar, we pulled it apart so much that it almost became its own adaptation. There are also adaptations like Medea is a brand new play. Right, totally, yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I really argued that I didn't want it to be called Medea, but I'm glad it is now. But I, yeah, I really argued against that because I was so, I said, this is a new play. But um, play for two kids, essentially. Play for two children. We, um, Anne-Louise Sarks had the extraordinary idea of, of flipping it and making it the story of Medea from the point of view of her two children. Uh, putting it in literally in the laps of the of the innocent and watching them in the last hour of their lives without them knowing it, but we do. Mm. And it was, I think, one of my that working with Annie Lou on that uh, was one of my favourite uh, things I've ever done uh, because she just uh, she 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 changed my way of writing. She it wasn't me just sitting down at a computer by myself. It was incredibly collaborative and and. Um, and and we it came about through many 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 workshops. Weirdly, that's had about eight productions around the world now. Yeah, around the world. Yeah. Yeah, and and we go wherever it goes. Annie Lou and I turn up <laughs> if we're not already involved, and it's great seeing it in different languages and seeing that the jokes still hit and the sadness still um, looms over each production. There's some. I guess. The, I guess the the thing that we're talking about here with Masquerade and Medea, and even with Harp to a certain extent, it are the stories that resonate from a long time back yeah. that, that I still want to take on as a writer mm. and explore because I guess it's exploring my own childhood too. Is that what leads you to adaptation? Oh, I have no idea what really led me to adaptation. I think Jasper Jones was the first one mm. I ever did. Uh, that was for uh, Black Swan. Mm. Uh, not Black Swan, sorry, um, Bark and Gecko. Uh, and John Sheedy asked me to to do the adaptation. And I was terrified, but the great thing I learned about adapting that uh, was when I was very lucky. I had Craig Sylvie at the end of a phone or the, across a table to to really um, pull it apart with. And I had the, he was so gracious in saying, "But what do you want to tell? What parts of Jasper Jones, you know, resonate with you that you want to tell?" And so, in every adaptation when you're working with the right people, which I've been lucky enough to do, like Kit, like Craig, it's them saying, but what makes it your adaptation rather than just an adaptation? Uh, so that was, I guess, where I got a kick out of it and I got bitten by the adaptation bug, so to speak. Yeah, I, I think that's really clear that in all those adaptations you've done, including the Shakespeare's, which mm -hmm. you've you know, adapted, essentially, mm -hmm. um, you know, that your voice is very, very strong in those. Um, um, it, it, your, your, the way you tell a story is very strong in that. And particularly, you know, you talked Richard III and Julius Caesar at Bell Shakespeare, you know, to, with playing Cassius, but you also mm. did the adaptation of the plays mm. and then playing Richard III as well and that monumental performance of yours, you know, two ostensibly male roles. Very male. <laughs> very male. Very, I mean, very male roles, you know, like male villains, you know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I think about Mary Stewart as well, where you place those two extraordinary women on the stage and, and, and ex exercised most of Schiller's kind of maleness in the play. So it's very much a gender thing at work, I suppose, for, for you that's very important for you yeah. and particularly in the in the Mary Stewart I think it seems to me that your version of that play examines how confronting it is for people to have two strong women yeah um, and, and that's right that's right let alone one we get you know they they were chopping women's heads off for being the single powerful women let alone the two of them you know taking each other on uh Mary Stewart, uh, was, it was very, very important to me with Mary Stewart uh, to see the struggle, that to see that these women, all they had was each other and yet the world was making them enemies to one another and that they could actually learn from more, one another and, 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 and rule if they wanted to, but the, uh, the men around them. In other adaptations, which I'm, 
I don't mean unfortunately in a, in a crit critical way necessarily, but I mean, it's a shame that there's been no, as far as I know, I'm the only woman to adapt Mary Stewart. Right. Yeah. yeah. As far as I know. And, and so all of the adaptations I read were mostly by wonderful um, male writers, mostly European um, or American and mostly white. And I just couldn't hear the voice of the feminist. I couldn't hear the, the, the women, the, the queens were pawns in a male chess game. And with my Mary Stewart, I wanted to flip it mm. and make them the chess masters with their men uh, and then, you know, and eventually just scoot, get rid of the board altogether and just have the two queens um, having it out and having a very, very female discussion and having fun with each other yeah. uh, and having a laugh. And, and I, I just adored writing that play. And it was, by the way, it was all there. It, it is all there in the Schiller. It just needs, um, it just needed a female voice it needed Lee Lewis's incredible um, eye as well and those performances from those women to, to really amp it up. So I was really lucky to, to get to do that one. Yeah. Um, and with Richard III. Yes, um, let's talk about Richard. <laughs> I'm glad you're excited by that. Because I, I love him. <laughs> well, I have to say, I mean, for my money, it, it is one of the legendary performances in Australian theatre. Oh. And let alone, let alone your work dramaturgically on the play, but your performance as Richard, you know, I think will live for a long time. And mm, it's, you. yeah, and but also very special because, you know, I remember when Richard III's bones were dug up not so long ago, only a handful of years ago. Mm. And, uh, and we got to see the nature of his spine yeah in his real bones that would have meant something to you it made me cry i i have a spinal disability from my cancer treatment and had never realized that i was allowed to say that i was always told it was a deformity mm. or an abnormality these words that i used about myself that are terrible words um but when they pulled up Richard's bones and I saw them, I I just, the real Richard, by the way, not Shakespeare's Richard, this is the real man. And I saw my bones, my almost exact curvature. Uh, I was absolutely floored and there was, a, I had a really emotional response to it. And it was only, I think a couple of weeks later that Peter Evans said to me, Hey, I'm thinking about um, I'm thinking about Richard the Third. How would you feel about that? And yeah, it was just this. Uh, and 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 then at, a, at the same time, about two weeks after that, my mum called from you know Western Australia and said that someone had gotten in contact with her and done the family tree and discovered that we were on the Richard the Third line. Uh, you know, and so <laughs> it was this weird kind of blah, one of those universal things uh that uh that just yeah that meant okay maybe I can do him and maybe I can play him but also maybe I need to actually um speak up about my back about my own physical condition instead of pretending I've been hiding it for so long and using the wrong vernacular to explain myself and uh, so Richard allowed me for the first time to say I I have a disability and and also I got to show it. I insisted on showing it. Uh, it meant that my Richard, as far as I know, uh, had a little more self-loathing to him, um, but also a little more, uh, rather than playing a villain necessarily, well, I was playing someone who'd been broken and beaten and called the wrong names their whole life mm -hmm. and was trying to come into himself. He just didn't do it quite right. I adored playing him. Yeah. Yeah, I still carry him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it must have cost you a lot. I mean, in, in your daily life, you still experience a lot of pain, of course, from, from the results of that cancer. I do. I have a, um, uh, I just found out last week, I have a, um, uh, a couple of broken vertebrae in my back at the moment. So my back is crumbling uh, away due to the effects of, of radiotherapy. But 
I'm, you know, getting good treatment. Uh, weirdly, when I step on stage, I don't feel much pain. And I think that's that, what I was going to ask. Yeah. I mean, playing yeah. the third every night for as long as you did. Yeah. In, you know, even, that, that must have cost you. It cost me. It cost me it, because I was, I was uh, going back into my uh, posture that I have been taught not to do. I've been taught to present in another way so that um, I'm not so crooked and bent in the world, even though that's a far more comfortable position for me. So in a way, getting to walk around with him every night was far more comfortable, but I was also breaking all of these rules that have been put onto me. Um, I, I, yeah, I had several broken bones during Richard III from everything from projecting my voice. I broke a rib to a sword fight gone wrong. <laughs> I almost chopped my finger off. But he, um, I didn't feel any pain though uh, on stage. It was when I came off stage that I would um, kind of feel the agony of him and of me. But that was, that, that's part of the kind of joy of performing as him is I'm the real deal. <laughs> Only I'm not killing any children. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you know, you've experienced a lot of things in your life and, you know, we, we touched a little bit on your work in Vietnam too, where you've become very open um, about those struggles and then, you know, working on behalf of others who have suffered many of the same sorts of things around the world. Um, that's a really important thing for you to be in Vietnam. It is. It's hard. There's nothing I can do. That's the hardest thing is I do all I can. I use platforms in order to talk about the uh, ongoing legacy of dioxin and Agent Orange, not just in Vietnam, but throughout Southeast Asia and throughout um, the world, really, because the bigger picture is we must take care of our returned soldiers. We must take care of the lands that we attack on or we battle on or we invade. Uh, we must uh, we must remember the ongoing legacy of war. Uh, I have that literally in my blood mm. and my bones. And so it's it's so great to go back to Vietnam, Southeast Asia, and see, as we call ourselves, the brothers and sisters of the mist, um, which are where there are still children. I've held newborns in my arms that are still being born on a daily basis with what appears to be Agent Orange dioxin related illnesses uh, and that makes me feel very lucky uh, that I, I, the extent of mine was cancer. I know that sounds crazy, but, uh, but also that I have a platform in which to speak for these people should they need me to. Um, we're up against some damn big companies that invented this stuff and they're considered to be, uh, you know, war, necess necessities of war. They were a weapon and so they get us at that kind of, in that loophole, but at the same time, um, I won't stop talking about it or writing about it or, you know, just living it. Mm. I, I want to ask you finally, Kate, like if it would have been very easy for someone in your life to remain stuck in some way, you know, like in a small country town or you know, in your illness or in any number of things that have happened in your life, but you've come through them with an extraordinary level of passion and positivity. I mean, what, how, what sort of things have you used in your life to, to kind of move forward in some way? Community. It's always community. I have a good family. I have a fantastic family. Um, but more than anything, it's community. It's relying on uh, being allowed to uh, seek assistance from the people around me, making sure that they know the same way about me. Sure, I've had some massive hardships in my life, but everyone does and uh, they shift from scale to scale as well. So I, I have had hardships, but I've also had an incredibly privileged life. And... I was just brought up on the notion of you, you must always, always help people up. You must always help people sideways. You must, you must be there um, as a part of your community and for your community. Um, and, that, and that your community is a diverse and vast and worldwide community. So I think that's what's helped me the most is um, even though I was from a, quite an isolated country town, we were there for each other, you know. Uh, we 
Some of us couldn't even speak the same language, but we were there for each other. We all played on the same soccer teams and um, they all got me through the cancer. And, and I think that's what I take into my working life. Yeah. I also didn't, I had a very, very normal education. Like I said, I didn't, I didn't study literature or Shakespeare or anything at school. It was very public school education. And so I did rely on other people to educate me. And the only way I can do that is to ask questions is to keep asking questions and and be open for people to ask me questions whenever they need. That's part of the playwriting process and it's part of being a performer anyway. So Yeah, that's um, a very resonant answer in these months and in this week in particular. So thank you very much. A real delight and privilege to talk with you. Pleasure. Not any OAM. And <laughs> <laughs> I'll never get used to that one. But... <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. So Thank good to talk you with you. Me. You okay. too. Cheerio. Bye-bye.